Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll look at a restored portion of the old Sacramento Northern Railroad that was in operation for 47 years in Central California. We'll visit with a Colorado artist whose passions for photography and painting are carried over into his layout, and visit one of the largest home model railroad layouts around. The Rugenisch Kleinbahn is a narrow gauge operation serving the resort area of Rugen Island in Germany. Once part of the DDR, its restored tank locomotives and scenic ride make it a definite tourist destination. Rugen Island sits in the Baltic Sea off the northern coast of Germany. At 350 square miles, it is Germany's largest island. For more than 100 years, it has also been one of its most popular tourist destinations. A one and a half mile long bridge separates the island from mainland Germany. People come here for the rejuvenating powers of the air and water and they come for the beauty. The primary attractions are still the sparkling sand beaches, which offer solitude and relaxation. The stunning white limestone-like salt cliffs, carved by nature out of the island's eastern shore over millions of years. Impressive architecture fronting the luxurious resort hotels and spas, which have attracted visitors for generations. And of course, the century-old Rugen Railway, offering visitors and residents an historical experience that is becoming increasingly rare in both Europe and across the world. Since the line was privatized in the 1990s, it has become even more of a polished attraction to those visiting the island. It runs from one resort town to the next and past some of the most beautiful sights the island has to offer. It's a narrow gauge steam blowing family attraction and it's constantly under restoration. And each one of the locomotives has a story to tell as do the employees who work them. In the Prussian state, they had a special railroad law, which simply made it easier for local communities to build narrow-gauge railroads. And it was only about a third of the cost compared to building a standard-gauge railroad. So it was a cheap way to build. The right-of-way had only sand and gravel, and they used nails to fix the rails instead of screws. So they could build the lines very fast and cheap, and you could build tight curves, which allowed you to build spurs to private customers at almost any location. So even a lot of the farmers got their own spurs. We have a lot of special stories, but one of the most interesting is from a particularly hard winter. We always have strong winds on the island, even in winter, and that causes some pretty high snowdrifts. Back in the winter of 1978-79, we had snowdrifts over three meters high, which means that the snowdrifts were higher than the locomotives. And one of the trains, which ran between Serums and Bints, was stopped by a drift. We needed a thousand people to go there and just dig out the train. We started digging at the roof of the locomotive. We worked so hard and got so warm that we had to take off our wool and cotton jackets and hang them on top of the light poles. That's how high the snow was, so high that we stood close to the top of the poles. The roof of the train was even with the top of the snowdrift. Well, I bought this uh, engine uh, back in 1980. Um, it was built uh, before the Second World War for the German army. It was in service uh, with the army, even in Russia. It survived uh, being in Russia. And then after the war, it uh, uh, came down to Austria. That was in service for 32 years along in 
along with uh, three different lines, state lines. After World War II, the German railroad, the Deutsche Reichsbahn, or DR, operated this narrow gauge until it was given back to the former owners, the county, and that was in 1996. The DR used the most modern locomotives of the former private Rugenisch Kleinbahn, the Vulcans, from 1914 and 1923. In 1965, the DR brought two very modern Henschel steam locomotives from a closed narrow gauge railroad here to Rugen. In the 1980s, three big 210 2 type 7Ks were brought from Saxony to Rugen. They were really much too big for Rugen, but at that time the DR only had these locomotives to upgrade the rolling stock here. In the past 20 years, every one of us on the staff learned to run these locomotives. We had to. And today, they are still workhorses here, especially in our busy season. Altogether, there are seven steam locomotives here, which are owned by Rugenisch Kleinbahn, and two more are rented. And we have two diesel locomotives as well. One of them is extremely rare. It had been built in World War II for military service. Ich habe als Kind äh, die Schmalspurbahn kennengelernt in meiner Heimat. We had a narrow gauge railroad in my hometown, so I had been very familiar with narrow gauge ever since I was a young child. And I guess what you like as a child, you will probably like as an adult as well. My big love are the narrow gauges, just exactly like the one in my hometown where I grew up. So I'm a big rail fan to begin with, and I'm especially interested in narrow gauge railroads. Then, here in Rügen, a lifelong dream came true, to have my very own narrow gauge railroad. I have lots of fun, and the employees all really work so hard to satisfy our visitors. I do hope that lots of people will come to Rügen Island to do this railroad. It really does make me happy. My main job is being publisher of a model railroad magazine, Model Eisenbahner, and now I'm running this real railroad, too. So isn't that the best situation of all, to be able to combine your hobby with your business? The Rugen Island Railroad will put you right on track to a simpler time in a beautiful place. All you have to do is enjoy it. The Rugen Island area is not very well known in the West, and it is a definite tourist stop if you are headed for northern Germany. Next, we're headed to Pennsylvania to visit one of the world's largest home layouts. See how many of the 1,800 cars you can count as they weave through the Allegheny Mountains. When it comes to model railroading, does size matter? It does if you want to run a truly operational, prototypical layout. Ken McCory's HO scale layout has been called the world's largest home layout, and that was back in 1998, before he added yet another 700 square feet to it. The additional space allowed him to model the Harrisburg Terminal at the southern end of the Buffalo Line. Although it was always a multi-level railroad, with the main grade from the upper to lower level running over the Allegheny Mountains, the grade is now much longer. The old summit was 64 inches high, and the new one is over 75 inches high. This monumental layout is the result of years of work and experimentation. Ken used to build layout after layout only to tear them down after just a few years, or even a few months, because he got bored. But when he met Charlie Karanji in 1978, all that changed. I heard about operations on other railroads, uh, but never got to visit, and Charlie had an open house in 1978. 
and I visited his railroad and uh, during the open house, got invited back for operations and uh, it really changed my outlook on the hobby. With operations, it was more of a build a railroad for a purpose and operate it for a longer period of time. Uh, it's cheaper, you don't have to go through building materials. Uh, and also learning history uh, of the area you're modeling, the era, uh, vehicles, buildings, signs, rolling stock. Ken's favorite steam engine, the Pensy I-1, led him to model the Central Region Northern Division in Central Pennsylvania. I modeled the Pennsylvania Railroad from about 1981 till 1994. And after painting Brunswick green, which is a fairly boring color. Uh, did a couple Conrail units for a friend of mine and really liked the bright blue. And we also realized that I knew a lot more about the operations of Conrail on the Buffalo line than I did in the Pennsylvania Railroad. So I decided to make a switch to the Conrail era, which is the uh, 1979 to 1982 era. This layout wouldn't look like central Pennsylvania without a steel mill, and Ken made sure he did this one upright. It's about three feet wide and 120 feet long, taking up 300 square feet. My favorite spot on the railroad is probably the steel mill. The number of hours I put in a scratch building through blast furnaces, it has the heavy industrial look of central Pennsylvania, and I think it succeeded. This successful layout boasts over 230 locomotives and 1,800 cars. Ken had to count them for insurance purposes and to keep track of his numbering system. He has no idea how many turnouts are on the layout. Everything is housed on the second floor of this barn, which was built specifically for the huge train room. Initial construction of the railroad, we did a lot of work at night. And there were usually six to eight cars parked outside uh, the upper floor of the barn has no windows, so there's no lights. That night we were doing some uh, track painting. So I had opened a door at the back of the barn to allow some fresh air in. Uh, the police drove by and saw this light where they hadn't seen a light before. And they also had been curious as to what was going on in the barn. They had this big, this large building. Uh, they had a number of cars parked outside at night with no people around. Uh, so that evening, the local chief of police stopped by and knocked on the door. One of the crew members was downstairs, and he came up and found out what was up here. And now he and a number of the other people in the local police force actually come to our open houses in November. Ken not only credits his friends for helping him build his layout, but also for creating the scenery. There are about 16,000 trees here another component that was critical to making the layout look like central Pennsylvania. Operating the layout is also a friendly affair. Ken gets about 25 friends together about once a month for a full operating session. Ken says there's enough on this railroad to keep him interested now. And seeing everything this layout has to offer, that's no surprise. As with all model railroads, Ken says that this one will never be completed. He's already planning to expand. In a moment, we'll head to Colorado to visit Mike Deneman. Mike is one of the few people who gets to enjoy trains both as a hobby and through his professional life as a photographer and illustrator. But first, let's go to Central California, where a section of the historic Sacramento Northern Railroad has been preserved at the Western Railway Museum. Could this be a mirage? Are we really seeing quaint electric trains traveling across the open prairie? And how is it that these folks find themselves riding on an electric interurban train that hasn't operated in its original setting for over 50 years? And just where did this old trolley come from? The wonderful time machine that has transported us so vividly into the past is the Western Railway Museum located in Northern California's Solano County. This magnificent museum gives visitors the opportunity to ride historic streetcars and interurban electric trains meticulously restored to their original condition. The museum's purpose is to preserve the history uh, of the electric railroad era. 
Uh, we preserve uh, rail cars, documents, um, uh, all sort of corporate histories, um, anything that has to do with electric railroading. Uh, we like to focus uh, our efforts on Northern California and on the Western United States. Certainly, the, I think the most compelling exhibit we have is the demonstration ride that we give. Uh, we are a living museum, so, and we actually operate the historic equipment that we've restored. In addition to offering a 10-mile round trip uh, on the Old Sacramento Northern Railway every hour on the hour that we're open, we also, on the weekends, offer shorter streetcar trips, uh, which are about a mile and a half, and they take 20 minutes. They're a nice introduction to the museum. Uh, both trips loop around our shaded picnic grounds and our park and uh, go down a tail track which parallels the old Sacramento Northern Railway. In addition to the demonstration ride that we offer, we've also restored approximately uh, 25 of the 100 cars in our collection. And uh, so those are on display for the public to walk through. The line that we've been able to save and preserve is the old Sacramento Northern Line, which, uh, which came out of the merger of two separate uh, companies, the Northern Electric, which served from Chico to Sacramento, and the Oakland Antioch and Eastern, which went from uh, Sacramento to Oakland and then by ferry to uh, San Francisco. One of the very many interesting things about the Sacramento Northern Railway is that uh, you know here in the Bay Area we have a number of rivers and and large bodies of water that you need to cross to have a direct connection between cities. The Sacramento Northern solved this problem by creating a uh, gas-powered ferry engine uh, where they would actually take the trains coming from either Sacramento or from San Francisco and Oakland, load them onto a ferry, take the ferry boat across uh, this, the confluence of the Sacramento River and Sassoon Bay, offload the train, and then it would speed on its way at 70 miles an hour through uh, Solano County. A descendant of railroad workers, Phil has been a train aficionado all his life. It's not hard to sense just how he feels about the importance of the museum's mission. I feel very good about the work we do here. I feel it's very important that we preserve uh, history and uh, for the purpose of being able to learn from it. Well, I'll tell you something about this line we're about to switch on to here. It used to be the old Sacramento Northern ran fast interurban electric trains from Oakland up through Contra Costa County and up here all the way to Sacramento and up to Chico. Museums in general have the purpose of providing connections with people uh, between each other, with their past, and with their future. And I think that's one of the things that we take very seriously here at the Western Railway Museum is to try to provide a number of different connections for people. When they come out and they, uh, you see grandparents interacting with their grandkids and uh, sharing a connection about what life in America was like as they were growing up and being able to share that and reflect that in their children's eyes. Um, our ride is, is an amazingly fun, uh, family-friendly event. Um, the, the trip takes about 50 minutes, and you actually ride aboard uh, one of the historic restored streetcars or interurban cars that we have. There are historic structures along the line, such as historic Shiloh Church, which served the local uh, farming and agricultural community from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, you have beautiful Sassoon Marsh here, uh, which is one of the largest wetlands uh, in the nation. Um, you, also at the other end of our line, you have the Jepson Prairie, which is one of the last remnant prairies uh, in California, where you'll see an untouched, uh, unadulterated landscape. Uh, what we'd really like people to learn while they're here at the museum is not just the physical history of the cars and where they were built, which is important, but also the social history of how they really helped America evolve uh, in the early part of the 20th century. As we say goodbye to the Western Railway Museum, we can truly be thankful there are still people who understand the importance of preserving magical, mystical time machines. What happens when you've got a dad with a passion for railroads and a mom who happens to be a watercolor artist? You get Mike Daneman full-time freelance railroad artist and photographer. Although Mike credits his folks for inspiring his career, it's easy to see that much of his success comes from self-motivation, hard work, and tons of talent. From scenery for model railroads to acrylic paintings, book covers, articles, greeting cards, and calendars, Mike's lifelong interest in trains has been unleashed through his eye for beauty. In 1984, 
Mike got his first paycheck for pursuing his passion at Wisconsin-based Kalmbach Publishing Company. An employee for 11 years, he started as an illustrator for Model Railroader and became the art director for Trains Magazine. The job not only fed Mike's train habit, it introduced a new love, his wife Katie. In search of fresh artistic pursuits, the two moved to Arvada, Colorado in 1997. The move from an apartment to a home also meant more space, which allowed for more room for both of their hobbies. Mike spends much of his spare time working with model railroads. Because the old apartment was so small, his 5x7 design was easy to move. The N-scale Denver and Rio Grande Western layout is well on its way to becoming a new and improved Moffett Road. And since it now fills a 25 by 19 foot space, it appears as if the Danamans aren't planning on moving anytime in the near future. Well, the layout is easier to maintain and work on because of its size. I think a really huge layout would be a daunting task, and to me, that this one's plenty big, and it, it gets a lot of what I want to portray in model railroading, it gets, gets accomplished. Right now, the layout is shared by two of Mike's favorite railroad eras, the early 60s for being the heart of the industry, and the early 80s for the coal trains that he remembers as a kid. At some point, he plans to separate the two time periods for better representation. By not taking up the entire basement with track, Katie is able to use the second room for her hobbies, or more appropriately, to keep them out of trouble. Joey and Belle need their own bedroom to hinder them from going through Mike and Katie's and stealing things of importance. Mike does a fair amount of traveling in Canada and the United States in search of railroad photos. Not only are the images reprinted in railroad calendars and books, but they also inspire themes for Mike's paintings and backdrops. I'm able to go out and take photos of it. I'm basing the layout on the prototype from Denver Union Station to the Moffat Tunnel, so that gives me the ability to check it and take photos of it and base my backdrop on it and the scenery on it. And, and I am modeling the, you know, a prototype stretch of railroad, so that's helpful. One of the easiest things I found was to go out and I actually photographed a series of uh, panoramic views of the scenery and just in regular print film and I taped them together and was able to f form a very long panoramic view that I was able to you know, accurately reproduce on the backdrop. A recent effort for Mike is documenting the former Rio Grande engineers and crew members who still work the railroads out in Utah, which are now owned by Union Pacific. I've been spending quite a few years now really inspired to go out and capture the last Rio Grande locomotives and people, especially the people. I find them, especially when you're uh, hanging around with these guys long enough, you start to be able to be accepted as part of the crew in a way. and and. Uh, you're able to get good candid photos of, of people that you can't get if you just you know, come in and try to take a photo of them. Although Mike's work is a beautiful tribute to the crews who have worked the railroad since the beginning, it's sad to think that in the not so distant future, these images may be all that remains. Railroads are constantly changing and painting is a good way to uh, capture those past moments. Mike's photographs and artwork may be the only way that the last of the Rio Grande and the trains and people who guide them will be able to keep on running. The museum has chosen to stick specifically with traction and has thus carved a nice little niche for itself, even though it is so close to the California State Railroad Museum. That's it for this episode. Be sure to join us next time for more Tracks Ahead. <laughs>